a lovely day. Merry Christmas to those of you who celebrate Christmas. Happy New Year to those of you who celebrate the New Year. Happy Holidays to those of you who might be celebrating some other holiday. Welcome, everybody. So glad to have you here. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notifications bell. So glad to have you all on here. We're going to have a great conversation. Is it better if I do this? Eh. Eh. Either way, my face looks red, but that's just how it works. I, I am an Irishman. So there you go. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notifications bell. Uh, the way this works is I give my opening remarks, and then after I give my opening remarks, uh, after that, um, I do the roll call where I call you out as I see you, names and locations. I call you out as I see you. And then after that, after I call you out as I see you, names and locations, after I've already done my opening remarks, at that point I answer your super chat questions, and that's how it works. And so it's Christmas evening, not Christmas Eve, that was last night. Last night was Christmas Eve, tonight is Christmas evening. Big difference, right? Big difference. I, I almost called this stream Christmas evening live, but I couldn't do that uh, because then people would see it and think Christmas Eve, and they'd be like, Caleb, you're dumb. You said Christmas. You know, people are like that. They look for any opportunity to just jump on you. So I called it Christmas night. Christmas night chat. That's what I called it. So hopefully I'll get away with that. Um, but, uh, you know, people look for anything, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know if people have seen the... Um, uh, there's the, uh, it's the great, it's the, uh, the family guy where, uh, you know, it's like Peter Griffin. Uh, he, um, he's pretending to play the piano, the electronic piano in the store. You know, he's just kind of as a joke. And some guy walks over and says, wow, you're really good at the piano. And he's like, well, actually I'm not. And he lifts his hands up and the guy shouts, he's a phony, phony. Right. And then like for the rest of the episode, the guy is following him around shouting, he's a big phony. Yeah, I feel like that sometimes, right? If I had called this stream Christmas evening, which would be more accurate. I don't think it's full-on night. I mean, it is dark outside, but it's, you know, 8 o'clock. We're talking evening. But if I had called this stream Christmas evening, uh, there would immediately have been people who thought I said meant Christmas Eve, uh, thought it was Christmas Eve, and they would shout, Phony! This guy's a big phony! He's a phony! Ugh! So, you know, you got to be careful how you do these things. Um, but I'm in a good mood. I'm in a good mood, folks. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. If there's something you want me to talk about in the second half of our program, uh, all you have to do, all you have to do uh, is, uh, is send me a super chat and we'll go from there. So I wanted to talk to other about a few things, a um, few news items that stand out on this Christmas Day 2021. First item, Gazprom is not undersupplying Europe. Uh, they are playing up the idea that somehow Russia is responsible for the rise in gas prices in Europe. That is not true. The head of the Gazprom, which is the state-controlled natural gas corporation, in Russia has come out and said no, they have fulfilled all their obligations and they've received no new supply requests. Uh, meanwhile, we see Germany continue to, to mess with Nord Stream 2, even though the pipeline is completed. Um, but yes, the, the Russians are not responsible. Um, you know, uh, whites are demonized. I, what? I, okay. That's an odd question. Um, what is to be done with creationists? That's an interesting one. All right. Uh, writing them down. Thanks for the super chats. We'll be addressed in the second half of the show. I try to give an answer to every super chat question, mind you. I just got two very odd ones, but I'm going to answer both of those questions. The first one is really weird. The second one is, nah, okay. Um, but, um, you know, I will try my best to answer your questions. Now, I get a lot of super chats where people are like, hey, have you heard of uh, Robert Dawson III and his new book about... Uh, the sinking of the Lusitania in the... And I, I, I'll be like, no, I have not heard about that. I can't comment on it. But, you know, within reason, I try to give you an answer. I answer all kinds of questions. There was somebody on, on here one time who asked me about my favorite place to go shopping. I answered it. So you want me to answer those two questions? I will answer them. 
Um, but anyway, Gazprom, they're trying to blame Russia for the uh, natural gas problems in Russia. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, no, I haven't said that, Texas. I've never said that. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, Russia needs more people. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, gave a big point of saying, um, you know, gave a big point of saying, uh, you know what, I'm going to remove the person who's making false claims here. Um, ugh, you know, um, you know, uh, I'm going to... Um, uh, Anyway, Russia needs more people. Uh, the Russian president came out and encouraged Russians to have children. Encouraged Russians to have children. And uh, I think that was a very, very cool thing. We do need more people in the world. Overpopulation is a myth. Um, you know, the issue is not that we have too many people in the world. The issue is that we have an irrational capitalist system. We have an irrational capitalist system uh, uh, that uses resources not in a strategic long-term way, but rather for the short-term gain of capitalists. Um, the problem isn't too many people, and with a socialist planned economy, we could very easily use resources in a rational, long-term, sustainable way. So the fact that Russia is calling for more people to, you know, have children, uh, saying they need more people in Russia, I think that's a great thing, and it shows kind of a stand-up against this Malthusianism that dominates, you know, dominates discourse nowadays. They try to blame human beings, say that human beings are an inherently evil species, etc. Um, and I'm glad that Russia isn't buying into that, right? Um, because, you know, that's, it's not correct. So there you go. There you go. What else? Yemen is facing uh, bombardment. Uh, the Saudis are continuing to commit their horrendous uh, atrocities against the people of Yemen. There's bombing going on, uh, et cetera. And at the same time uh, that that is happening, uh, Yemen is continuing to fight back. Yemen is continuing to fight back. Um, and they are resisting the Saudi onslaught. Uh, and they are striking. And they are saying that they would be capable of striking vital sites in Saudi Arabia. They could actually hit uh, some very key places in Saudi Arabia if Saudi Arabia continues its bombing. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but the Yemeni people, uh, the resistance in Yemen, recently shot down a spy drone. A spy drone uh, was shot down. So they've done this before. This happened before. But they shot down a spy drone in Yemen. Um, there have been some horrendous uh, details. I'm talking about the split of PCUSA and CPUSA. Okay. Um, you know, um, uh, there have been some horrendous activities by Israel uh, in the West Bank. Uh, Palestinian protesters have been targeted uh, by the Israelis. People have been injured. Um, that just went on today. You can read the details about that. Uh, Israel continues to violate the rights of, of the Palestinian people, you know, settlements, etc. There were some incidents today. Um, for the first time, Iranian exports to Russia exceeded $1 billion. There's been over $1 billion of Iranian exports to Russia this year. That's big. That's very, very big news. That's very, very big news. And it shows what is a recurring theme on these lives about the new economy that's emerging around the world. Russia, China, Venezuela, Cuba. Um, no. Uh, I answered that one with a no, no. Um, but, um, yeah, Iran exports to Russia. Um, yeah, there you go. And, um, and I guess I will, um, hmm, I guess the next thing we can talk about, I don't know if folks know, but the gray zone recently proved that I was right. The gray zone recently proved that a book that I wrote called Bread Tube Serves Imperialism was right. Now, I don't know if folks saw this, but earlier this year, I wrote a book called Bread Tube Serves Imperialism, in which I came forward and I said that Bread Tube, uh, the cluster of YouTube personalities, were focused on refuting the right wing while claiming to be teaching people socialism and Marxism, uh, that they are probably being covertly supported, uh, you know, by elements of the establishment. Um, and that the evidence that I had for this, the most, you know, there were a number of uh, bits of evidence, mainstream media highlighting the work of contrapoints and celebrating contrapoints. 
Um, the fact that these people had no background in the Marxist movement whatsoever and just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Um, but the main piece of evidence that I had was that I found out that Dr. Steve Hassan, uh, the cult expert, uh, was, was an advisor to BreadTube and that he has been advising BreadTube and, um, you know, and, and teaching them how to quote unquote deprogram the alt-right. He appeared on CNN called for mass deprogramming of the country in response to Donald Trump and the January 6th events. So based on that, um, based on that, I said it looks, you know, that BreadTube has been created by the establishment uh, and that, sure, refuting the right wing and their ideas is good, right? Uh, but at the same time, they're targeting legitimate anti-imperialists and Marxists like myself. Um, you know, okay. Writing it down. These are good super chats. I think we're going to have a long Q&A tonight. These are good super chats we're getting. I'm writing them down. That's good. I like these super chats. All right. Um, but I, I theorized, based on mainstream media propping up BreadTube, based on the fact that these people had no connections to the real existing socialist organized movement, uh, based on the fact that they're putting out uh, a pro-imperialist interpretation of socialism, based on the fact they reject one of the basic understandings of Marxism, which is overcoming the irrationality of, of the capitalist system of production organized for profit, based on the fact that they don't ever talk about the global system of monopoly capitalism and imperialism, and if you do bring it up, they say that's anti-Semitic, uh, based on the fact that mainstream media highlighted them, uh, based on the fact that none of them have a background, and based on the fact that, that somebody who is very well connected to the American intelligence agencies, Dr. Steve Hassan, who was, was, whose mentor is the main U.S. military psychiatrist, um, the main U.S. military psychiatrist, um, Robert J. Lifton, uh, somebody who, you know, is, is very well connected with, you know, the deep state uh, CIA, you know, intelligence apparatus of the United States. Uh, Dr. Steve Hassan, who has inside knowledge about the Unification Church and the Moonies, and they're tied to the CIA, etc. That, uh, that, that BreadTube is most likely tied to the intelligence agencies and a section of the U.S. government apparatus. That's what I wrote. Um, and now, Gray Zone uh, has documented evidence about what I theorized in my book. Um, they've come forward and they've shown that a uh, basically a, a think tank in the UK that is funded by the UK Foreign Office and funded by the British Royal Family is funding the work of Philosophy Tube, one of the main Red Tube channels. Now, I didn't talk about Philosophy Tube in my in my book. I didn't have time to talk about everybody. But yes, uh, you know, Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube is one of the main Bread Tube uh, voices. And Abigail Thorne is proven to be funded by uh, the British Foreign Office and by the, you know, the British Royal Family. So what I said was correct. Uh, they are a government operation. Uh, they are sponsored by some very powerful entities in the U.S. ruling class. That's proven. We have proof. Um, you know, um, that's proven. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have proof of it. Um, Audiobooks. So we have proof of this. It's now proven. Um, and, you know, it's it's legit, right? I mean, and I, I said, look, you know, there's a division in the ruling class right now in the book. I talked about Bonapartism, the struggle between one section of the ruling class and another, uh, the efforts to utilize uh, the working class uh, as kind of foot soldiers uh, and how they're trying to, you know, Trump's faction was, you know, clearly fighting pretty hard against another faction. And so it appears that Bread tube was an attempt to stir up and mobilize young liberals to be the foot soldiers against, you know, right? True Christian, if not a socialist. So there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, and I was right. Uh, I was absolutely right. Now, uh, you'll notice, did any of the bread tube folks go, 
darn, any of the BreadTube fans or any of, any of those BreadTube voices getting up and saying, wow, that's true. No, what has been their response across Twitter to the article? Well, people like myself, people like Max Blumenthal, people that, you know, are critical of imperialism say, wow, okay, I, that makes sense. Um, you know, Jackson Hinkle did a great stream about it. I posted a clip of it earlier. Um, you know, you can talk where he goes into great detail reading the Max Blumenthal piece. I'm going to be streaming with Max Blumenthal later this week. So we'll, we'll have a great opportunity to go into depth about all of this and many other things, apparently. Um, but, um, uh, that, uh, you know, there's so many of these bread tube voices. They don't seem at all concerned about this. Um, uh, they they have said that um, that it's transphobic. Why? Because Abigail Thorne is trans. Well, the issue is not that Abigail Thorne is trans. The issue is that she's funded by the UK government. Um, but that's, you know, that's, you know, they don't seem to care about that. It's transphobic. Uh, the other allegation, because I'm quoted in the article, and I am somebody that someone has pinned a label to, and they say I'm a Nazbol, which is ridiculous. I'm not a member of a political party in Russia during the 1990s. Uh, but because they can pin a label on me, that discredits it. Well, the documents that reveal the funding of Abigail Thorne's channel were not produced by me. That was something I wrote a book and theorized about. Um, and they have documents proving I'm correct. So that doesn't disprove anything. And it just shows you how despicable these bread tube fans are. Um, that they don't care. They don't care. They are listening to people who are funded by the government. Straight up funded by the government. Bread tube, we have proof, smoking gun proof, that bread tubers. Abigail Thorne, Philosophy Tube, is being funded by the British government, by the same entity, the very same think tank that funds efforts to bring down the Syrian government and regime change propaganda against Syria. And all these people can go, do is go, oh, that's transphobic. Oh, Caleb's in the article. He's bad because I heard that he's a, a something, some word I've never heard before. And it, it just shows you, uh, it just shows you how disingenuous they are. But Jenny Lynn just said something, and she's onto something. Because I noticed a lot of these accounts that were suddenly calling out Max Blumenthal, a lot of these accounts, interestingly, were very, very small accounts that didn't seem to do very much except harass people. And you, you gotta wonder. You gotta wonder. There's some YouTube channels that don't seem to do very much except attack people. And they seem to attack me, they seem to attack Jimmy Dore, they attack Jackson Hinkle. And they don't really have much an ideology of their own. And there's a lot of these, like, really small Twitter accounts that just start tweeting out of the blue. And it raises a lot of questions. Um, you know, raises a lot of questions. Oh, that's a good one. Raises a lot of questions. Raises a lot of questions. Um, I mean, it, it raises a fair amount of questions. Now, um, you know, I mean, does that not raise a fair amount of questions? I think it does. I think it raises a fair amount of questions. Um, and, you know, how much, other than the algorithms promoting BreadTube, other than YouTube and Facebook and Twitter being rigged to basically get BreadTube into people's, you know, view, other than that, how many people really are like, you know, firm, loyal adherents of the BreadTube community? For example, one thing we've been doing with this YouTube community is we've built an organization. The John Brown Volunteers, full-time cadre. Shout out to them out there in Texas. They're doing great work. They are had a great Christmas today. They might be playing Monopoly right now. They're a good bunch of folks, um, you know, and helping out David Cedillo and San Angelo Solidarity. Great folks. Uh, Center for Political Innovation, uh, you know, uh, Students and Youth for a New America. We're building an organization here. Now, why has Vosh never done this, right? I mean, Vosh is getting hundreds of thousands of views on his channel. I mean, imagine if Vosh started trying to build an organization. He could probably have a lot of people. But does he want to do that? No, right? Do the people who watch Vosh want to form an organization? No. Uh, imagine if Chapo Trap House was trying to form an organization. Do you know, do you think, do you, I, mean, do you, I mean, how many views, how many listens do they get? Do they get anything? No. Right? Um, they already have an organization. It's called the Democratic Party. Um, and if you look at it, it's like BreadTube is not really about trying to build a socialist movement. It's not about trying to build a socialist organization. It's about complementing the movement that CNN and the Democrats are already building. It's about making money through entertainment and controlling 
controlling the language and the conversation around socialism to try and prevent anyone from actually building a real socialist movement, especially if such forces are anti-imperialist. And you can see that, right? You, you can see that. They, they are not trying to build uh, an organization. They are trying to... They are trying to kind of manage, you know, spontaneous sentiments that already exist beneath the surface. Um, and you can see that. Um, and it's just, it's kind of a damage control effort on the part of the ruling class. And it's also about, you know, cultivating and mobilizing young people against the right. Against the right, um, which is good. I mean, a lot of the libertarians, I've debated Stefan Molyneux. I ripped him to shreds. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. I, I ripped Stefan Molyneux to shreds. Um, and, you know, I've debated many people on the right. I've debated many, many people on the right. So, you know, I, I, it's great to refute libertarian nonsense. It's great to, uh, to refute, uh, you know, the, you know, capitalism is the greatest system. Anyone who disagrees is an evil commie. You know, it's great to refute those ideas. It's great to refute, you know, free market stuff. But, the problem with BreadTube is they don't refute it with Marxism. They don't refute it with Marxism, and they largely refute it in a way that, that, that is pro-imperialist, um, and that's the problem. So I'm really glad that Max Blumenthal, uh, you know, wrote that article and stepped up to the, the plate. And I got to say, you know, I, I, I Max is amazing. Uh, he's an amazing guy. Grayzone does amazing work. But we really started this here on this channel, right? We got the ball rolling, uh, as Jackson Hinkle recently said on his stream. Nobody was brave enough. Nobody was brave enough uh, until we came along. Until we came along, we were the first ones to go ahead. We published the book Bread Tube Serves Imperialism. We came out and we said these people look like they look like some kind of deep state operation. They look like some kind of section of the ruling class. They look like this is some kind of Bonapartist counter gang that's been set up. Um, we said that on this channel. And people, like, went after us for saying this. How dare you say that? That's a crazy conspiracy theory. That's nuts. That's insane. How dare you? And we were right. 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 And how many times have we been right, folks? How many times have we been right? Like, somebody needs to go over the record. How many times have I told you something was going to happen and then it happened? Right? Because it's, it's not a small number of times that this has happened, right? This is not the first time that I've had a feeling that something was going to happen, and then it happened. Like, you know, and it's not that I had a feeling. It's not like I'm, you know, getting messages from God or something like that. It's that I understand how these things work. I, I understand. I understand how the economy works. I understand the laws of Marxism. I understand how political movements work. And I saw a bread tube and I said, Bing, 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 bing. You know, I'm doing all this research on the synthetic left and all this. And, you know, they, quote unquote, glow in the dark, right? I mean, they they were a dead ringer. And, uh, you know, when Steve Hassan, who was very well connected to the intelligence apparatus, is advising them, and Steve Hassan goes on national television on CNN and calls for people to be deprogrammed from Donald Trump. And the main thing that BreadTube does is try and dissect right-wing views, but they also somehow equate legit legit anti-imperialist leftists with the right, uh, and they can't tell the difference, you know, and they're, you know, and they're defending U.S. foreign policy. Um, well, that, that seems to indicate that we're onto something. And now Gray Zone has the, um, right, Brezhnev. All right. Um, now we have the proof. So, there you go. There you go. Um, so that's kind of, you know, and let's go over everything we've accomplished this year. I mean, seriously. I mean, between the Bread Tube book, uh, Jesus is a Socialist, the book published, uh, we had two national gatherings, one in Pennsylvania, the other in California. We have a full-time outreach team, we have a demonstration that was so important, the demonstration for Alex Saab in Times Square, that Nicolas Maduro, the leader of Socialist Venezuela, hailed it. The CPI sent its first international delegation to Nicaragua, uh, and that was a really big achievement. Um, 
And uh, now we have our full-time outreach team. They worked in New York City for five months. And now our full-time outreach team is working in Texas currently. And pretty soon they'll be in Chicago. Um, and we we published a book about bread tube and, uh, right? Time management advice. And um, we're on fire. And thank you, Marching Orders. I do appreciate it. We're on fire. I mean, we are marching ahead. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of people that were under the impression that if we just got harassed enough, we would stop, right? I think that's really what a lot of these people think. If they just harass us enough, we're going to stop. And we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. If they just lie about me personally enough, I'll stop. No, if they just, you know, if they just, you know, tell a dirty enough lie about us, we're going to stop. If they just, you know, cyber bully my wife enough, we're going to stop. If they just, you know, if they just uh, make fun of us enough, we're going to stop. We're not going to stop. We are not going to stop, right? We are not going to stop. We are not going to stop. We are going to build the Center for Political Innovation, and we're marching ahead. Um, and in fact, the opposition is a compliment in a way. It shows how important we are. We are a force to be reckoned with. Um, we are a force to be reckoned with. Um, and that's what we're doing. Um, so I want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart who's watching right now. Uh, I want to wish you a, a Merry Christmas. Uh, I want to wish you a happy holiday. I want to thank you for all the hard work that you've done. And we are many, they are few. Thank you for your super chat. I want to thank you for everything that you've done, um, and I just want to uh, want to congratulate you for being part of this amazing project, this amazing project, because we are moving ahead and we are getting things done, and they're afraid of what we have to offer. We are doing something amazing here. So not long opening remarks tonight at all, right? We're only 27 minutes in. Um, but, um, I think that's where I'm going to end my opening remarks for tonight. I'm not going to get too, you know, into depth about stuff. Um, and I think, uh, now we'll do the roll call, call you out as I see you names and locations. Then we'll start answering super chats and then we'll be done. Names and locations, roll call. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Kieran from San Diego is with us. My wife, Machitas is with us as well. Very good. Hawthorne, New Jersey. Uh, shout out to you, darling. Hawthorne, New Jersey. Joshua Tree, California. Kinky, Utah. Ben from Denver. Cleveland Pirate Alex. Clyde Bank. Marta in Poland. Utah, sir. Los Angeles. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, ben in Suffolk County. Springfield, Missouri. Chicago. Io Hillary in New York. Shout out to you, Io. Shout out to you. I hope you are doing well. David in China, Wisconsin. Chaya from Montreal. Good friend of the program. Longtime friend of ours, Chaya from Montreal. Mo in Toronto. JT24 in Vicksburg. Uh, Khadija in Brooklyn. Shout out to you, Khadija. Uh, Solidarity from San Angelo. Shout out to you, San Angelo Solidarity. We love you. We love the work that you're doing. Um, Baron in Seattle. San Francisco. Albuquerque, New Mexico. West Virginia. Bermuda. Uh, New Zealand, Rice from Adelaide, Australia, Cincinnati, Ohio, Nelson from San Antonio, Texas, David from Hamilton, Ontario, Scotland in the bag, Kim from Jersey City, New Jersey, Vancouver, Canada, Jason from Georgia, Gabby from Chicago, shout out to you, Gabby, welcome, Gabby, Mobile, Alabama, Philly, Denmark, Denmark, Mindanao to Midwest, Binghamton, New York, Enoch from Australia, Wattsville, Vermont, Jeff from Grand Canyon, Arizona, Jonathan from Arkansas, Helen from Riverview, Canada, Finland, West Virginia, Lockport, New York, um, Tony from Oregon, Alex from Brazil, Woodside, New York City, uh, Munich, Germany, Queen and Quinn and Meredith from West Virginia, Chicago, Cleveland Pirate Alex, uh, Dewey Donahue in New York, Mosin from Iran, uh, Carmen from Reading, Pennsylvania, North Pole, Arctic, Ottawa, Canada. Ottawa, Canada. Very, 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 very good. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. I saw somebody mentioning the book by Robert Kennedy on Dr. Fauci. I have just ordered my copy of it, and I'm going to read it for myself. 
and make up my own decision, which is what I would like people to do you know, with my work. I listened to some of Jimmy Dore's interview with Robert Kennedy. Um, interesting stuff. I'm going to read the book for myself. I'll tell you all what I think. I will tell you all my thoughts on Robert Kennedy's book, but I'm going to, you know, hold off until I've done some proper investigation, which is the right thing to do. Um, you know, and I mean, I've, I met Robert Kennedy once a long time ago. That was kind of neat. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the fact that he's, he's raising some questions, you know, I, he deserves a fair hearing. And the fact that, that book is the top book on Amazon, I'm sorry, I am not going to let Wall Street imperialism tell me what topics I'm allowed to discuss. I don't care if you can put a label on somebody. I am going to read it for myself, and I'm going to make my own decision about Robert Kennedy's book. Uh, I am going to investigate and find out the facts and determine for myself what I think of it. I don't know what to think yet, um, but I will be making that decision for myself. And I'm glad Jimmy Dore and others are engaging with an idea that the establishment has told us is off limits because I don't trust the establishment. Um, where, where is mandate going? Uh, very good question. So let's start getting into these super chats. Uh, did you say that whites are demonized? No, I did never said that whites are demonized. I never said that. Um, so, you know, um, I have reported uh, on the controversy surrounding critical race theory before, which is a real controversy in the United States, and I report on it objectively. And that is the argument that right-wingers make. They say whites are demonized in critical race theory, and I have objectively reported that right-wingers think that. Uh, when I'm a reporter, I'm on here giving my opinions, right? I'm on here telling you what I personally think. But when I am reporting as a reporter, it is not my job to tell you what I personally think. It is my job to report on the controversy. And when I reported on the critical race theory controversy, I showed what the right-wingers think, and I showed what the, the liberals and left-wingers think. I did not give my own personal opinion about, about the issue. And that is not what I do. When I am a reporter, reporting on the news, it is my job to be objective. Um, and the idea that I shouldn't report on a controversy... I'm sorry, you know, school board meetings are being shut down, the right wing, you have to talk about this, right? You have to talk about this. Should I? All right. I say socialist, you know, guilty over holiday. Writing it down. These are all good questions. Consumerism. Very good stuff. So, you know, I, I mean, you have to report on these things. Um, but, you know, um, Critical race theory is not Marxism, right? And let's be real about this. The right wing calls it Marxism, and stupid liberals, who like the ones who run the CPUSA, don't know the difference between critical race theory and Marxism. You want to read Marxism on the question of race in America, read W.E.B. Du Bois, read Huey Newton. Um, you know, uh, you can read, uh, there are many great Marxist African-American historians, uh, you know, uh, but uh, the idea that critical race theory is Marxism is not correct. Now, I never have said whites are demonized. And, and to be fair, okay, I, whites are not demonized, right? There is no, you know, there's no one going around. I mean, there may be people, individuals say, trying to be edgy or whatever, but there's no like bias against white people in U.S. society for being white, right? The richest people and most powerful people in U.S. society are white. Um, that said, there is a growing demonization of impoverished white people, I would say. And that is not new. I mean, there's always been hatred for impoverished white people, uh, you know, for Appalachians in particular. Uh, you know, they talk about, you know, quote unquote, white trash. Um, and I will say that for a long time, I mean, when I first moved to New York City, people used to come, you know, come up to me and say, um, people used to come up to me People used to come up to me when I would give a talk someplace in New York City, and they'd say, I love your accent. I'd be like, what accent? You know, and there was a feeling when I first moved to New York City, I remember the way I was treated. There were people who thought that because I was from Ohio, uh, because I came from a small town, um, you know, because I, you know, I, you know, God forbid I knew people, you know, I grew up in a town where most people voted Republican, that I must be a, an idiot and a buffoon, um, you know, and there was a whole lot of contempt. Uh, there's a whole lot of belief that all the people, you know, in the red states and all the low income white workers who are voting for Trump all just need to be killed. And that's, I hear blatant statements like that all the time. 
Um, you know, and this is not, an these are not anti-white statements. These are not anti-white statements because it doesn't, there's plenty of wealthy white people in New York City and that doesn't apply to them. And, uh, there, you know, there are plenty of, there are plenty of, you know, this is a class statement, right? And there is a feeling among a lot of the woke crowd. There's a feeling among a lot of the woke crowd that, uh, that if you're impoverished, I've actually heard this. I will never forget actually hearing this. This was said to me once that if a person of color is poor, it's because of racism. But if a white person is poor, oh, you know, clearly they must be just an idiot because if you're white, everything in the United States works out for you. Well, that's not necessarily true, right? It's easier if you're white. Absolutely, it's easier if you're white, right? And no one should deny that. And people on the right who want to deny that, that's, that's problematic because that's not true. Um, you know, there definitely is a privilege and, a, and a, you get a boost by being white in the United States. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, the idea that there aren't poor white people, you know, there was a friend of mine who went to, went to Rikers Island. She was an Occupy Wall Street activist and she got busted. She got busted. She went to Rikers Island. She did two or three months on Rikers Island. One of the things that came up in our conversations, I had many conversations with her after she got out of jail. One of the things that came up is, you know, she grew up in a trailer. You know, she grew up, she's from Texas. She grew up in a trailer. But when she was in Rikers Island, all of her cellmates were women of color. And they all thought she must be a trust fund kid. Uh, she th th they thought she must be a rich girl who uh, has, um, you know, has kleptomania, right? Uh, and she said, you know, I'm going to jail because of this Occupy Wall Street protest. I'm charged with assaulting a police officer, et cetera. And they thought, oh, no, no, she must be, she must be a rich girl with kleptomania because no, you know, you know they, they, no white person could ever, you know, could ever, you know, be in jail, no white person. I mean, and, and a lot of the people that she was in jail with on Rikers Island were convinced, were largely convinced that, uh, that, that poor white people don't exist. This is a really common, you know, belief. And if you live in New York City, you might very easily think that, that poor white people don't exist. Uh, they do exist. Working class white people do exist. And, you know, there are working class people of color and there are working class white people. And New York City, I will say this, right? If you go where I grew up in Ohio, you know, there are mainly white people, but there are people of color, and especially more recently, there have been a lot more people of color. But it's way more integrated, and that's one thing. The United in New York City has more people of color, but there's a lot more segregation in New York City, um, in the kind of jobs that people do, for example. Um, you know, I mean, there is a lot more, there is a lot more segregation here, right? Uh, here in New York City, people, if you are white, people assume that you are middle class, and if you are black, people assume that you are working class. Well, there are plenty of black professionals in New York City. There aren't very many poor, low-income white people in New York City, though there are some. There are some, right? I mean, if you go, you know, to certain neighborhoods, there there, there are some, right? People who uh, people who never left in the infamous white flight, people who never moved to moved to, to Long Island. There are some poor white people in New York City, but not very many of them. And that that a lot of times there is a kind of class-based. I guess prejudice is the right word, where people assume if you're white, you must be middle class. People assume if you're black, you must be working class. That's very offensive, you know, to, there's a lot of middle class, you know, there's a lot of black doctors in New York City, a lot of black lawyers in New York City, um, but people will treat them and treat their kids like they must be, you know, poor. Um, you know, there was the shop and frisk scandal that I talked about, right? Do you remember this? I don't know if I, I talked about it on a recent live, the shop and frisk scandal where African-American folks were going to Macy's and they were going to other, you know, nice department stores and they were paying for their the items they bought with their credit card, just like anybody else. And immediately the cops would jump out and cuff them and, 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 and arrest them. Why? Well, they assumed that because they were black, they couldn't possibly afford this item. It was horrendous. It was a horrendous practice, shop and frisk. But it was based on this very unique phenomenon in New York City where there is this belief that if you're in New York City and you're white, you must be middle class. And if you're in New York City and you're not white, you must be working class. Um, and it's not true, but because it's, it's prevalent, uh, that is the stereotype in this city. And like my friend uh, on Rikers Island was, you know, was telling her cellmates in, in Rikers Island that she'd grown up in a trailer. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it was possible. No, you know, you know, she couldn't have grown up in a trailer. No white person is ever poor. Well, there are plenty of poor white people in this world. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, go to Oklahoma. There's a, I mean, go to Oklahoma. There's plenty of poor white people. And thank you for the super chat. There are plenty of poor white people in Oklahoma. Um, you know, Joe Biden is, is a great example of this. You know, Joe Biden, what, what is the statement that Joe Biden made? You remember, I don't know if you remember the statement that Joe Biden made. One of Joe Biden's infamous racist statements, right? All right, so China.
one of the one of the statements that that Joe Biden made uh, is he said, "quote Poor kids are just as smart as white kids." That's ridiculous. Poor kids are just as smart as white kids, and he was trying to say low income kids are just as smart as wealthier kids. He was trying to say black kids are just as smart as white kids, but he he conflated low income with black, right? And uh, white with middle class. Joe Biden thinks low income white people don't exist. Well, that makes sense, right? Because he's a Democrat. And the Democrats think poor low income white people don't exist. That's true, right? The Democrats, uh, the Democrats think that uh, low income white people are, they don't exist. And if they do exist, they're all in the Ku Klux Klan. And I hear woke people, I've seen woke people many times say that, you know, all the all the people in the red states, all these, you know, wh white trash in the red states need to be exterminated, need to be killed. This isn't about hating white people because there are plenty of wealthy white people. In fact, I hear these statements from wealthy white people. This is not about hating white people. And that's what the alt-right does. The white supremacists, the alt-right, they say, oh, it's a war against the white man. It's white genocide. Well, that's, that's, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. It's not. You know, I'm sorry, but the wealthiest people in the United States, a lot of them are white, you know. And, you know, you know, you can talk about cultural divisions and politics in the United States is there is there are ethnic components to U.S. politics. Right. I mean, you know, McCarthyism, for example, when it started out, it was a fight between, you know, in urban areas, largely between the Roman Catholic, you know, Italian and um, and uh, and Irish uh, firefighters and cops who were the Democratic Party in the urban areas and Jewish folks in the labor movement. And it was very much, I mean, the fact that the Rosenbergs were the, the only, were the couple that got the death penalty, right? They executed the Rosenbergs. You think they just randomly, you know, that, that, was, that was a political statement. There was a lot of anti-Semitism stoked up against the Rosenbergs. And it was the Catholic trade union federations that pushed the Communist Party out of the trade unions. And a lot, under, underneath a lot of the, you know, the raging anti-communism was subtle anti-Semitism. They were trying to, trying to link communism to Jews. And part of, you know, they, they, they linked Roosevelt and communism to Jews. And part of the McCarthyite, the beginning of McCarthyism, it was those, you know, the urban political machines of Irish and Italian Catholics that were in city government in Boston. You know, the Kennedy family were really into McCarthyism when it began. I don't know if you know this, but, you know, you know, Papa Kennedy was on the House on American Activities Committee. No one talks about that. Um, but, you know, it was, it was largely the, the, the urban political machines that were Irish and Italian fighting, fighting against the, um, the Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party, Henry Wallace, and the labor movement that had a lot of Jews in it. And it was, it was a cultural, ethnic fight. And I'm sure someone can take that I said this. Someone can take that I said this, okay, and, and take it out of context and say I'm saying something. You know, I am obviously against McCarthyism. I think Henry Wallace was an amazing person. I think the Communist Party and Roosevelt were amazing. So, you know, if you're going to take that and say that I'm saying something anti-Semitic, I can't stop you from lying. But, you know, there, there you go. But there was an ethnic component to it at the beginning. Um, and that, you know, politics in the United States is, you know, if you go to the developing world, there's a lot more openness, right? People will be like, you know, if you go to the developing world, people will frame politics in an ethnic way, right? Uh, they'll just straight up say, well, we don't like this group and we like this group. They will. In the United States, it's much more subtle than that. But there's not demonization of white people in the United States. So whoever says that I say there's demonization of white people in the United States, uh, they're, they're wrong. They are probably seeing me reporting on how conservatives believe that and they are taking it and doing something with it. But, but there is demonization of low-income whites. That's true. Now, obviously, the demonization of people of color is far worse, right? All the super predators stuff that laid the cases for mass incarceration, etc. Um, you know, there you go. All right, writing it down. You know, so it's it's complicated. All these issues are complicated. There's nuance to all of this. And if you just want to ride the woke wave and go along with whatever, and that's the problem. If you can't understand nuance, if you can't understand nuance, you're going to end up serving imperialism, right? You know, um, I mean, and that's the problem, right? Is that if you just ride the woke wave, you're going to end up serving the ruling class. So you have to understand these minute differences. There's no white genocide, there's no demonization of whites. I'm no one. No one in the United States is a victim because they are white. That's not. That's not happened, right? No one suffers on the basis of being white. 
white people do suffer because they are low income sometimes. That is true. And there's an increasing demonization of on a cultural level of things like country music and such. But that's not targeting white people. That's targeting Appalachia. That's targeting rural folks. That's targeting low... They're not being targeted because they are white. They're being targeted for other reasons. And compared to the demonization of... Compared to the demonization of black people, it's nothing. But we can be aware of this. I, I will never forget. Let me just end, you know... One of the most atrocious things I ever saw, one of the most atrocious things I saw is, I don't know if you remember that horrendous mass shooting that took place in Las Vegas, uh, where, you know, that sniper, um, I, I, ha I have to, I'll have to check out that book. I haven't read it, Tusker. Um, where that sniper in Las Vegas was shooting, you know, the people in line to go to the country music concert. And I saw with my own eyes people uh, who call themselves communists, um, you know, people who call themselves communists uh, saying that they were happy about it because people who listen to country music are, are all Trump supporters and they're all racist. And I mean, that was horrendous. That was really, really horrendous. And country music is racist. And well, you know, the term hoedown was invented by African-Americans. I don't know if you know that, but you know, uh, a lot of things in country music are appropriated from black people, right? Now, obviously they're appropriated, um, you know, so that's a form of racism in and of itself. But you know, I mean, the idea that, that you know, that, that country music is all a, a white invention, that's not true. Now, nowadays, it's largely white audiences who listen to country music. But, um, but yeah, I mean, country music, uh, you know, country music in a lot of ways has African-American roots. I mean, the, the ho Google hoedown, where did the term hoedown come from? It wasn't white people. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but on top of that, right, the fact that they were saying, they were saying that somehow, oh, they were glad this shooting happened because all these people in line, you know, a lot of them were Trump supporters and they're in, they're in line for country music and that's racist, redneck. I mean, that's awful. That's a really hateful thing. It was a really hateful thing to say. It wasn't anti-white. It wasn't anti-white. In fact, the people I saw saying it were white. So it, it wasn't anti-white. Okay, so get... And this is what is toxic about the alt-right. The alt-right is all about trying to make white people racist. That's basically what they're about. And so they take the real resentment that a lot of working class white people have about their situation in life and they say, oh, you're suffering because you're white. And that's what fascists and white supremacists do, as they blame it on, you know, they, they try to stoke up racial resentment. And of course, if the idea is you're suffering because you're white, that makes the white capitalists your friends, right, against the people of color, right? And, and you know, it, it makes it about race. Our job is to create a united front against racism and against imperialism. That is our job. Our job is to build a, a, a program of economic demands to challenge the power of capital. Our job is to, to mobilize working class people to fight for their rights, to demand a government of action that will fight for working families. That's our job. Our job is not to convince people they're suffering because they're white. And if someone does that, they're trying to mobilize racism. Um, and so, you know, we need to talk about that. The alt-right wants to, wants to tackle, and I, I don't know, I, I, mean, I gave way too long of an answer to this, but the person said, accused me of saying that whites are demonized. No, whites are not demonized. In fact, you know, some of the wealthiest, wealthiest people in the United States are white. And white people run the United States, largely. There are different types of white people. There's different ethnic groups among white people that have different levels of power and influence. Um, you know, but, but yes, there are low-income white folks. Low-income white people are demonized and culturally and politically, but not because they're white. Uh, so there you go. Um, uh, Brian Berletic, we'll talk about that. I like his stuff. I really like his stuff. But anyway, anyway, I gave way too long of an answer to that. All right, next question. What do we do with creationists? Well, you know, when I was a kid growing up, right, creationism was a really big deal in the town I grew up in, right? I mean, my family, you know, my father and is a biologist. And, um, uh, okay, October Revolution, which countries invaded USSR? Invaded USSR. All righty. So, you know, town I grew up in, most people were creationists. Um, my father's a biologist. Um, you know, my mother is very religious. But, you know, the, the upbringing that I got was, you know, my parents were both uh, Christians. But the feeling was that, um, was that uh, you know, that, that, you know, that evolution, uh, 
Darwin, Darwinian evolution and creationism kind of walk hand in hand. That was kind of their feeling. Um, and I got very angry about this because in my town, almost everyone was a creationist. And they would say, no, the Bible is literally true. And if you don't, if you don't believe in creationism, uh, if you don't believe in creationism, then you're not a real Christian. And, you know, they're... You know, and I, I used to get very upset with people and argue about it. And I, I was really, this is because I was, you know, my father was a biologist. And so I was kind of, this is what I was hearing at home. This was an issue that was vitally important to my father, someone who believed in biology. Um, I had a teacher in high school, uh, a science teacher in high school, uh, who, you know, my father just looked up to, just thought he was such a great man because... Uh, because he, um, he did believe, you know, and, and taught Darwinian evolution, um, and, you know, and, and, um, you know, and did that. Um, I'm at the point where I, you know, I'm not really offended by creationism anymore. You know, uh, there's someone in CPI who's a creationist. I don't agree with him. I think that Darwin's evolution is, is fact. I mean, there are, there are issues with how Darwin presented it, and that's important, and you have to distinguish between that. Darwin was a white supremacist. I mean, he was. That doesn't mean that his theory, you know, in and of itself was wrong. And Darwin also projected, I mean, you know, in the way Darwin, you know, we've all seen that, that image, right, of the, you know, it's like the, the monkey, and then it's a little more monkey, and then it, it turns into a person. We've all seen that, that image, right? Well, that image, you know, feeds into a narrative that modern biologists say is not correct. It's like the idea was that, you know, we're getting higher and higher until we ultimately get to the greatest species. Evolution is leading up to the greatest species the human. That's not true, right? And modern biologists say, no, evolution has no, there's no goal to evolution, right? So, you know, that's fair. But, but that said, I mean, Darwinian evolution, I mean, it's, you know, fossil record, hello, you know, I, that's where I'm at, okay? But I say that with deepest respect for people who disagree, um, you know. Um, why oh, do... Writing it down. I say that with deepest respect at this point for people who disagree because I, I guess, you know, I was frustrated when I was growing up. I was surrounded by the Christian right, the religious right, and I was very frustrated by them. And I thought they were, you know, they were all supporting George W. Bush and the invasion of Iraq. Uh, they were, um, you know, they were, you know, big supporters of capitalism and hating Muslims. And so, you know... In opposition to them, I thought is religion was the central issue. Um, I began, you know, and some of the communist groups I was paying attention to were really emphasizing the atheism. Um, and so because of that, I, I was very, very opposed to creationism. I'm at the point where, you know what, I know a lot of creationists who are socialists. I know a lot of creationists who are anti-imperialists, you know. I mean, I was, I was on a ship full of creationists who believed in, you know, rejected Darwinian evolution, Iranians, right? Now, not all Iranian Shia Muslims uh, reject, uh, reject evolution. There are other, you know, it's complicated. But, um, but you know, you know, I was, a lot of the Shia Muslims I was on a ship with risking my life to get to Yemen uh, don't accept Darwinian evolution. Um, you know, and so I'm at the point where I don't think that issue is the cutting edge. Okay. And I mean, I would prefer that, that you know, science be taught in school. Um, you know, and the, I guess the important thing is that creationism is not science. Creationism is religion, right? And that, you know, in school, when you're learning about comparative religions, you should learn about Adam and Eve, and you should learn, you know, about that in literature and in comparative religion. But science is science. Religion is religion. Philosophy is philosophy, right? And that creationism has no place in the science classroom, right? Religion of any kind has no place in the science classroom. It's not a science. Um, but that said, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, the religious right, you know, the Mike Pence Christian right is toxic. It is in so many ways. And the new atheist movement uh, that was Richard Dawkins and uh, Christopher Hitchens and others, it, it was, you know, it was as Obama was coming in, they needed to give the Christian right a punch in the mouth. The, the Christian right had, you know, had been a, such a big component of what U.S. imperialism was doing. The neocon, the neocon evangelical block, right? Jerry Falwell, Ronald Reagan, Pat Robertson, that block that kind of held U.S. society together throughout the late Cold War, starting in like the mid '70s up until like the financial crash of, two, crash of 2008, 2009. The, like, the core that held the U.S. together in the military and in the government, you had the Republican Party, evangelical Christians, the military, the, the hawks, anti-communism, the neocon right wing. 
the evangelical Christian right was a big part of, of holding U.S. society together during the Cold War. And the world was changing. And uh, George W. Bush alienated uh, the Muslim world by calling the war uh, in, the, in the Middle East, calling it a crusade. Uh, George W. Bush shot up the oil prices, which really helped Iran, which really helped Russia, uh, which really helped Venezuela. Uh, you know, uh, the neocons, uh, they cut off the United States from Europe and they cut off the United States from the Muslim world. And the USA realized that in order to, to beat back Russia and China, it needed Europe working with it and it needed, uh, it needed you know, Muslims. It needed like the Muslim Brotherhood to work with them. So the ruling class said, okay, in light of the financial crisis and the rise of Bolivarian socialism and the rise of Russia and China, the rise of Iran, uh, you know, in, in, there was kind of a, a, a perfect storm where it just seemed like the neocon political formula, um, you know, you know, you know, uh, the neocon political formula, um, at that point, it just wasn't working. Um, and so in order to in order to, you know, to, you know, make U.S. imperialism more effective, Obama came in and they had to break up the Christian right. And so part of that was promoting Richard Dawkins uh, and Christopher Hitchens and uh, Sam Harris and the, the, the new atheist movement, it was called, it was fomented by the ruling class. The New York Times, uh, CNN, other people brought these people up there, the new atheists, and they let them push back against the Christian right. And it gave them a punch in the mouth. And the Christian right got a pretty hard punch in the mouth. And what was funny is what the New Atheist Movement was saying was not particularly new or profound. It's the kind of thing that atheists have been saying for years. I mean, they point to contradictions in the Bible. They point to horrendous things in the Bible, like, uh, I think it was it Abraham sacrificed his daughter and he made a promise to God. The first thing I see when I get home, I shall sacrifice to you. And he gets home and he sees his daughter and he's like, all right, and he kills his daughter for God. I mean, that's horrendous. That's horrendous stuff, right? And it just, you know, they they, they just, they hit it harm. They hit it home. Um... All right. All right. Russia gas exports. They they hit it home. And, you know, the Christian right is still around, but it's much more, you know, much more weakened. Um, and that's not a bad thing at all. I mean, the Christian right was a really toxic force. But I'm at the point where, you know, a lot of those new atheists were libertarians. You know, they promote Ayn Rand. Sam Harris, from what I understand, is now promoting racial pseudoscience. So based on that, you know, I don't think, you know, nowadays creationism is not the cutting edge. Uh, my position is I think that, you know, evolution should be taught in school. Um, but, you know, um, and I do accept Darwinian evolution mostly. Um, but, you know, that said, there are other issues. Okay, next question. The Party of Communist USA versus the Communist Party USA. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I know Dr. D'Angelo D'Angelo. I mean, I don't speak to him very much anymore, but, you know, I was in the Workers' World Party at the time, but I was friendly with Dr. Angelo D'Angelo, and they had something called Red Star Publishers, which was a book publishing house that published a lot of, republished a lot of very good books. So, you know, I got them to republish The History of the Three Internationals by William Z. Foster. So if you have the new edition of that book that's available on Amazon from Red Star Publishers, you can thank me for that because I approached Angelo D'Angelo and Red Star Publishers and George Grunthal, and I said, please re reprint that book. And so that's where that book came from. And they republished a lot of classic communist books. Um, Another ML government come to power again. I, and, you know, they republished that. Um, you know, and they, they published a lot of good books. And uh, I knew a number of the people that formed the Party of Communists when it was formed. And um, I decided not to join them uh, because they didn't have very many resources. And they seemed to just be an Internet party. Uh, the impression that I got of them was that they were an internet party. Um, I was not very impressed. Um, and when I met with them, uh, you know, I was still in the Workers' World Party. I had a pretty solid position in the Workers' World Party. I might have slightly agreed with them more on issues like Trotsky and such, but I did not, um, I did not see them as, as becoming a real force. I didn't see them as having real political infrastructure, uh, number one. And I was a little bit put off. I will say... I'm a little bit put off by by the Stalin fan club stuff, right? I I think that Stalin played a very positive role defeating the Nazis, industrializing the USSR. But even then, I was starting to realize that, you know, the USSR is never going to come back. The Soviet Union is never going to return. Um, and that the idea that we need to just restore everything to the way the way Stalin did things, uh, that that's not correct. Um, 
And, um, you know, I met Grover Fur. I, there's video of me speaking on a panel with Dr. Grover Fur. I have a lot of respect for Dr. Grover Fur. I don't, I, I can't endorse everything he's ever written, but his book Blood Lies is amazing. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I agree with a lot of what Party of Communists puts out, but, um, you know, but I mean, I'm not a member of it, and I know a lot of people who are in it. Chris Halali, uh, who's the candidate they ran for for office in Vermont, is an amazing guy. An amazing guy. I have absolute respect for him. Um, and uh, you know, like I, I mean, a lot of the best people in CPI are PCUSA members. So I, I, you know, the way I see it, you know, PCUSA is one of the best groups around, but it's not the group for me. Um, now, why did they break with the Communist Party USA? It wasn't exactly a split. It, it really wasn't a split. What I understand happened was that Angelo D'Angelo had been kicked out of the Communist Party. He's somebody who was in the Communist Party in the 70s and was kind of the leader of, of the Communist Party in Staten Island, New York. Um, and, uh, you know, as the Communist Party, as the Cold War came to an end, the Communist Party got more and more, you know, reformist and more and more... You know, and then a guy named Sam Webb was their leader, uh, and Sam Webb basically, I mean, I saw Sam Webb speak in 2008, and I was blown away by, he, the man was just a Democrat. And I mean, and, I, and that a lot of Communist Party people I've met over the years are just Democrats. Uh, that, not all of them, but, you know, I mean, there was a guy I went to, I went on a trip with one time who was a member of the Communist Party, and I talked to him, and I figured, okay, he, he supports voting for the Democrats as a tactic. No, this guy really believed the Democrats, that, you know, Barack Obama was a good guy, uh, who was trying to do his best against the right wing. And a lot of these people I talked to in the Communist Party were just Democrats. And Angelo D'Angelo is a real communist. I mean, he's a he believes in what the Communist Party is supposed to believe. And that that's a lot of people's experience with the Communist Party in those years was there was this disconnect, right? Um, that, you know, I mean, many people over the years have said to me, like, they joined the Communist Party and they would go to the, you know, it's like you go to a, a meeting once a month and you sit there with like five other people and they talk about, you know, campaigning for Democrats in a city council election. And they go there and they're like, is there another meeting where we actually talk about communism? And no, there's not. And there's not really much to being in the Communist Party, right? It's just, you know, it's just you, you, you are, you're a Democrat. It's this, this association of people who do campaign work for Democrats and they have a nice website and they have a, a magazine that comes out like once a year or something. And um, that's what a lot of people have told me for the years. That's why I never, they say I tried to take over the Communist Party. I never tried to tell people to take over the Communist Party because I've known people for years who've been quitting the Communist Party, been angry about it. So, you know, I love the fact that there are a lot of people in the Communist Party who listen to what I have to say and like what I have to say, but never have I called on people to join the Communist Party. Never have I been like, oh, go sneak into the Communist Party. Never. And, you know, like I think the serfs, that clown the serfs and who does his like stupid in insult comedy channel, he thinks that I was in the Communist Party and I was kicked out of the Communist Party. Well, I was never a member of the Communist Party. I was never kicked out of the Communist Party, right? That's how much credibility this guy has, right? And he's like, you know, I mean, you know, so it, it just shows, but no, I've never called on people to join the Communist Party. I have never been a member of the Communist Party. I like a lot of people in the Communist Party that are my friends, despite as dramatic as things have gotten. And I think they're upset because a lot of the new members and a lot of the youth in the Communist Party do listen to me. Um, and, you know, that infuriates them. But then that's only going to be exacerbated. The more they denounce me, the more of them that are going to listen. So I, Sam Webb later left the CPUSA and defended and tried to get former Sanders supporters to support Clinton. I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. And there you go. All right. But yeah, it wasn't a split. It was like people that had kind of been on the outs with the Communist Party for a long time formed a new party. It wasn't a split. It, it, the way I observed it, Angelo D'Angelo had not been in the Communist Party for a long time. He'd been out of the Communist Party. Angelo D'Angelo had this, this group, uh, U.S. Friends of the Soviet People, and that every couple months they would have an event in Manhattan. And it was at the Gay and Lesbian Center in Manhattan on the top floor. They would have an event where they would show a movie from Soviet Russia. They'd have a presentation by Grover Fur, and it was the Stalin Society of New York, or it was not the Stalin Society, the U.S. Friends of the Soviet People. I would always go to those events. I would listen to Grover Fur. I would listen to the presentations. And, you know, it was interesting to hear, uh, to hear what those folks had to say. Uh, but it was a lot of older folks who had, they were basically kicked out of the Communist Party. Um, but they were, you know, they were still people that had spent their whole lives around the Communist Party as the Communist Party got more and more, let more and more uninterested in communism. They kept doing what they were doing and they would hang out with Angelo at these, at these events, uh, U.S. Friends of the Soviet People. They'd watch movies, they'd get up. Uh, and a lot of times I felt a little, it was a little nostalgic, um, the way they would talk, um, you know, it was very, um, 
I don't know. It was, they were talking about the good old days. You know, it was a lot of, a lot of older folks. I mean, I mean, there's a guy who got up at one thing. He said, I'm 98 years old, you know, and everyone applauded and, you know, people in wheelchairs and people, it was, it was an older crowd of people, uh, you know, comrades, people who've given their whole life to it. And they would get up and talk about how amazing the communist party was, how amazing Gus Hall was, um, how amazing the communist party was, how amazing Gus Hall was and how much they hated Sam Webb and, you know, um, how much they loved Stalin. And it was kind of sad, um, you know, but, you know, I respect them. I'm glad they did it. I'm glad they kept the flame alive, right? And they held on to their beliefs. They didn't surrender, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I respect those folks on some level. I really do. And I'm not gonna, you know, but but yeah, PCUSA eventually came out of that. Um, you know, you know, uh, it eventually came out of that. And I, I respect those folks. And, you know, they defended the legacy of socialism. They called out the Communist Party for moving in its pro-democratic direction. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I kind of don't see PCUSA as a group that has a lot of political infrastructure, though. Chris Olali, that guy is for real. That guy in Vermont, Chris Olali, that guy is for real. He's amazing. Um, um, would you say that the leadership of, I'll just do this now since we're on this, the leadership of the Communist Party is more liberal in the rank and file? That's always been the case, always in my lifetime. The Communist Party USA always has a bunch of young people in their 20s who join it who actually believe in communism and are mad about the fact that the leaders, you know, don't, right? The leaders, uh, you know, the leaders of the Communist Party are people whose parents were leaders of the Communist Party, whose people, who their parents were leaders of the Communist Party. And what started out as a tactic, during the Cold War, it was a tactic to support the Democrats because the Democrats wanted to negotiate more with the USSR. What, what started out as a tactic became a law. And that's all these people know. That's all Joe Sims knows. That's all he knows is campaign for the Democrats. He doesn't know anything else. And he's not a young man. And all he's ever done his whole life is campaign for the Democrats. That's all he ever, has ever done uh, his whole life is campaign for the Democrats. So if you go into him and you want to do something else, he doesn't even know. He doesn't know how to do it, right? And it's like that's, you know, you know that's a lot of these folks, um, you know. And so there's a whole history of young people, young people, that really believe in communism. They join the Communist Party and they get kicked out. The YCL, it dissolves and gets reformed every four or five years. It, it you know, it, it gets dissolved and then a new crew of young people join it and they start to have their own ideas. They start to actually promote communism and then they all get kicked out and then the YCL forms again with a new batch of 20-year-olds and I've seen this over and over and over again. And again, that's why I never, people came to me and said, I'm thinking about joining the Communist Party and I said, I never said not to, right? I'd never tell anyone not to, but I would always say, well, okay. I mean, but I never gave the order. There was never any secret conspiracy with me and Lyndon LaRouche to get people to join the Communist Party. Never did that. Never did that. Um, you know, um, I think there's a lot of great people in the Communist Party. And in fact, a lot of people join the Communist Party because they have good instincts. They don't want to be associated with bread tube. They want to be associated with Marxism-Leninism. They want to be associated with the party of William C. Foster and Gus Hall and Huey Newton and these real revolutionaries that were around at one point. Well, that ain't what the Communist Party is anymore. But if you want to meet people who, who are, maybe that's the place you should go. But, you know, now they're desperately trying to Caleb proof the Communist Party because they're scared of people listening to me, but they're giving me a huge amount of advertising in in the um, in the process. So there you go. All right, next question: uh, Are China, Nicaragua, etc., socialist countries, our teachers when building socialism? I wouldn't call them our teachers. We should study them, though. We can learn from them. Um, oh. Nicholas Lynch says, Caleb, my girlfriend got me City Builders and the Kamala book for Christmas. Looking forward to reading it. Well, I hope you like it, Nicholas. I really do. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on the book. Send me an email after you read them. Caleb Moppin at gmail.com. Merry Christmas to you and Merry Christmas to your girlfriend. Uh, but there you go. Um, you know, we should study all of these socialist countries, but blindly follow none of them. That's been my, my experience. We should study Nicaragua. We should study China. We should study Venezuela. We should study Cuba. We should study all the socialist countries while blindly following none of them, right? Because when socialism comes to the United States, it will be uniquely U.S. But we can learn from their experience for sure. Um, but we don't want to be dogmatic. Um, okay. All righty. A lot of super chats tonight tonight on a lot of interesting topics so we're just going to keep going we got a lot of them to do so we might start speeding up but there you go all right um how does the usa have a state religion 
while barring state religions? Well, that's a good question. We don't officially have a state religion in the United States, um, but Christianity is kind of treated as the state religion de facto, but it's not the state religion. Right? Now, the reason that we have in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or restricting free practice thereof. Why? Why does it say that? Well, nine out of the 13 colonies had a state religion. Did you know that? Yeah, Massachusetts, the state religion was Puritanism. Uh, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, the state religion was Quakerism. Uh, uh, you know, American Society of Friends. In Maryland, the state religion was Catholicism, and nine of the 13 colonies had an official state religion. And when they were trying to get the 13 colonies to go beyond the Articles of Confederation and merge into the United States with the U.S. Constitution, there was a fear. There was a fear on the part of Maryland, for example, that if they had a federal government in the United States, that they would lose their right to be Roman Catholic in Maryland. There was a fear, you know, among, you know, a lot of these smaller states. Rhode Island, I believe, was formed. I forget who it was. It was somebody who didn't get along with the Puritans. Somebody the Puritans declared to be, you know, uh, uh, what is it, an infidel or a, a I don't know, a, a blasphemer. Somebody who had a fallen out with the Puritans, a religious difference with the Puritans, went and set up Rhode Island to be their own colony where they could have their religious beliefs and not get put in jail by the Puritans, right? And there was a fear there was a big fear uh, on the part of many of the religious minorities in the United States, like Roman Catholics and others, Quakers, that, that if they joined the United States, their ability to practice their religion would be restricted by the federal government. So they had to have, it was like a compromise. The U.S. government would have no established religion. There wouldn't be a U.S. government religion. That way, that way, the, you know, there would be no threat to any of these minor religious groups. Um, and on top of that, uh, no one would, there would be no laws restricting the free practice of religion, right, passed by the federal government. Um, and originally that was just at the federal level. States did have state religions. Maryland had Catholicism as its state religion, Pennsylvania, Quaker, Puritans in, in Massachusetts, etc. Then you had, there was another Supreme Court ruling that later said that all of the rights granted at a federal level have to exi exist at the state and local level. Right? And that was a change. You have to remember that. Used to be, if you wanted to ban free speech in your town, you could do that. If you wanted to ban free speech in your state, you could do that. But at the federal level, they couldn't restrict free speech. But the Supreme Court stepped in and said, actually, no, all the rights that you have at a federal level, you also have at a local level. That was a big game changer. So then at that point, the feeling was, okay, even local and state governments can't have a state religion. Fine. Um, so that's how it is currently, right? In the United States, we don't have a state religion. But you know, we, eh, you know, a lot of people, and this is a lot of atheists and a lot of people get rightly upset about this because it's not really enforced, right? They're better than they used to be. I mean, I went to a public school in the United States and this drove me up the wall and it drove me up the wall. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving every year, a minister would come in and at our public school, the whole school would gather for a, a Thanksgiving assembly where the minister preached at us. You know, and uh, there was a prayer at graduation. There was a prayer. Uh, there was a prayer at the beginning of the graduation ceremony, a prayer at the end of graduation. And, you know, and they were just constantly violating this, even though it was a government school. It's supposed to be no religion here, but they were constantly violating this, you know, at my school because it was a conservative right wing area. And on top of that, while they were constantly violating this, they were constantly going, and we're so persecuted. It's like, how are you so persecuted? We just, we had a minister come in against the rules. We had a prayer at our graduation against the rules. You know, I had, you know, uh, you know, I mean, we, you know, our, our school guidance counselor would come once a month and give us a character education sermon that always ended up getting back to God and the Bible somehow. I'm like, how are you persecuted? But somehow they were persecuted. And it drove me up the wall that these people were constantly breaking the law in order to, you know, in order to practice religion in a government institution. And then on top of that, they were constantly claiming they were persecuted for doing it. And I was just like, you're not persecuted if you're allowed to break the law. I mean, it was, it was weird. So it was very frustrating to me growing up. But that said, you know, Christmas today, December 25th, is a national holiday in the United States. Why? That's a Christian holiday, my friends. Christmas is a Christian holiday. Now, to be fair, now, many people say Christmas is a secular holiday. A lot of Muslims, for example, two Muslim friends of mine celebrate Christmas. They make a tree, they give their kids presents. 
but they don't observe it as a religious holiday. And some people have said, okay, well, maybe the reason that Christmas is a federal holiday in the United States, this is a fair argument, is because Santa is not Christian. That's true, right? Um, you know, Santa, reindeer, and a lot of the, the Christian celebrations, Christ, original that left, you know, a lot of the Christian tradition, or a lot of the Christmas traditions are not explicitly religious. Okay, fine. Uh, what does it say on our money? And God we trust. Well, you know, I mean, you can argue, okay, well, God can be a Muslim God, a Jewish God, it can be a Hindu God, it can be whatever, but it's still acknowledging God, so that still excludes atheists. So, you know, on our money, it says in God we trust, uh, on our money, um, in God we trust, uh, it says all that on our money, um, and, uh, you know, we still have Christmas as a federal holiday, and that, you know, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, we do it, it, the unacknowledged, officially in the United States, we don't have a state religion. But Christianity is kind of, sort of, de facto the state religion in the United States. Uh, that's true. Um, and that will probably change. I don't know. Again, we're, we're, we're in a weird period where I don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I've told you I think Roe v. Wade is probably going to be overturned. And the USA is dealing with, with a lot of cultural polarization and balkanization. And it may be that some kind of compromise is reached where Alabama can impose a state religion, honestly. They, they, we may get to the point where to hold the United States together to prevent some kind of balkanization, to prevent you know states from breaking away, we have to let red states adopt a religion. That kind of thing might happen, folks. We're in this weird period of, of the United States where a lot of things that you would never have thought are possible are suddenly possible. Um, so yeah, but, uh, but yeah, officially the United States has no state religion, but Christianity is de facto the state religion. And that's disrespectful to a lot of religious minorities. Um, you know, and that's not cool, right? And there shouldn't be religion in our public schools. You know, we've made a decision as a society not to have a state religion. So we should enforce that. Um, you know, and I mean, look, I mean, Christmas shouldn't be a national holiday, right? If we're not going to have a state religion, a Christian holiday shouldn't be a national holiday, right? I mean, I like holidays generally. People don't want to not go to work. You know, people don't want to go to work rather than not go to work. But to be fair, you know, either we declare, you know, winter, winter, I, I don't know. But, you know, in God we trust shouldn't be on our money, right? I mean, it shouldn't be, right? Because we don't, as a society, we are supposed to be, have no state religion, um, you know, so, you know, I mean, I mean, it is, it is a huge amount of hypocrisy on the part of the United States that if, if we've decided as a society we don't want to have a state religion, we need to be, I'm the kind of person, I'm like that. I want the rules to be either have a rule and follow it or don't have a rule. I don't like this gray area stuff. I really don't. I was the kind of kid, I read the manual of our school. I read the manual, you know, every year we got the school handbook they gave us. I would always read it. It always pissed me off. That like the, I, I remember the, um, what is it? The, uh, the dress code in the school manual. It said, it said like, you know, don't wear, uh, what did it say? It said, don't wear, don't wear flip flops and don't wear clogs or tap dancing shoes to school. Jeans should not be faded. It was like, it was written in the 1950s. And the dress code, everyone at my school knew what the dress code really was. It was women couldn't dress too skimpy. And if you were a guy, you couldn't have your pants sagging. That's what the dress code was. So I thought, why don't, we just update the, the manual and say women, you know, don't, you know, don't have cleavage, don't, you know, don't dress too skimpy, men don't have your pants sag. Why do we have written rules that are way out of date, way out of date, and we enforce something completely different? I mean, if we're going to have a dress code, you need to have an actual code written down. And the reason, right, and this gets back to the whole thing, they talk about the government of laws rather than the government of man. Right? The government of laws rather than government of man, right? If the rules are not what's written down, pretty soon the rules just become whatever the authority figure in charge says. Right? If you're not following, you know, look, if 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 the laws of the country didn't matter, right? Pretty soon it just becomes might is right. I'm the authority figure, I'm the cop, I feel like arresting you. There's a reason we have laws. We have a government of laws rather than a government of men, right? There's a reason we have these things. So there you go. All right, that was a long question. Next question, more audiobooks. More audiobooks. Yes, if people want to step up and volunteer, that'd be great. Char Char Darling is doing a great job. Charlotte is doing an amazing job. Uh, third chapter of Kamala Harris' book should be up soon. 
If anyone wants to volunteer to make an audiobook of other books, I'm down. We need audiobooks. A lot of people listen. A lot of people listen while they drive, while they work out, etc. So there you go. Um, can one be a true Christian if they're not a socialist? Well, Christianity is a religion, uh, not a political viewpoint, but I would argue that yes, one cannot believe in capitalism and believe in the rule of prophets uh, and still be in line with uh, the teachings of the Christian religion, right? If you believe that, that prophets should rule, that money comes first, uh, that is so contrary to everything that Jesus taught, I would argue, Kinky, you are correct. One cannot be a true Christian if you're not a socialist. But then again, there are many people who have socialistic values. I think they just don't put the words to it, right? There's a lot of people who, who you know, they, they do believe that people should have health care and jobs. They do believe people should have what they need. They just don't know that that's socialism. In their mind, that just means being nice or something, right? But ideological capitalism, ideological capitalism, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, Friedrich von Hayek, um, you know, Alan Greenspan, that stuff is definitely not consistent with the Christian religion. You know, it's, it's actually consistent with Satanism. Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan, they promoted that stuff. So there you go. All right. Should I reprint the bread tube book with Blumenthal's article included? Maybe. Maybe at some point we'll do that. I'm thinking about maybe doing a follow-up book that will include that article. Like a follow-up book on bread tube. Like, you know, bread tube revisited or something like that. Um, you know, but maybe maybe that's a good idea. All right. All right. Um, Fred Hampton defended the American Revolution. Of course, right? And let me emphasize, the 1619 Project is not, is contrary to what so many great African-American scholars and so many great Marxist scholars have said. And the notion that the entire reason the United States was formed was simply to preserve slavery is not historically accurate. Um, and you know, the fact that the ruling class is pushing this because of divisions in the ruling class, etc., that's not good. Now, obviously, you know, there, there was a lot of nuance with the founding of the United States. There were certainly people who did, you know, were motivated by a desire to preserve slavery to, to keep the United States. That's true. Um, but that was that was part of it for some factors. But, you know, I mean, Alexander Hamilton didn't believe in slavery. Alexander Hamilton was a supporter of the Haitian slave revolution and wanted to convey recognition on it. I really don't think Alexander Hamilton fought in the American Revolution because he wanted to preserve slavery, something he didn't believe in. When he, he was so against slavery, he wanted, he wanted the United States and the Haitian slave revolutionary government to have relations. So that, that doesn't fit, right? Thomas Paine was against slavery and actually not only was he against slavery, he advocated a guaranteed minimum income for all citizens. Right. Um, so the idea that Thomas Paine was trying to preserve slavery, that that's that's not true. Now, Thomas Jefferson, eh, he said he was against it. But, eh, you know, you know, many of the southern you know, folks absolutely were, were trying to preserve slavery. So it's complicated. The main issue was an economic one. Should the United States continue to flourish as an economy or not? That was the issue at hand. Should the United States have its own domestic economy or should it just be a hub in the British Empire global trade financial system? That was the divide. That was the issue. Right now, obviously, having the United States have its own economy had a negative side to it, like killing the Native Americans, like slavery, right? In the south of the United States, the slave economy you know, having the USA have a vibrant economy meant a slave economy, right? And expanding westward meant taking land from Native Americans. But also it meant the government investing in technology. Also it meant trying to raise living standards. And Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay and Henry Carey and some of the other voices, these were economists who argued that the United States could have a strong industrial economy and that the, the role of the state was to allow an industrial economy to flourish in the United States mainland, whereas the British Empire just wanted the United States to be part of their global free trade system. And ultimately, the British Empire are the ones who intervened to try and keep slavery intact in the U.S. South. The U.S. Civil War, you know, the British Empire was largely on the side of the Confederates because they wanted the cheap cotton coming from the U.S. South to come in. So the fact that that 1619 project was in the New York Times. That is a gross, extreme interpretation of the American Revolution that basically takes capitalism and global free trade British capitalism off the hook. 
Uh, it says that basically the British Empire, Adam Smith, all of that was fine. It was just the evil racist Americans, uh, you know, and that, that, you know, the British Empire was trying to get rid of slavery and the evil racist Americans were like, no, we want to keep slavery. And that was the whole purpose of the revolution. Fred Hampton didn't accept that. Huey Newton didn't accept that. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois did not accept that. Um, a lot of a lot of people, you know, Dr. Tony Montiero in, in Philadelphia, great African-American scholar, communist, revolutionary, he does not accept that. Um, you know, and I mean, there's an element of truth in it, but it's not the whole story. Um, and it's taking one aspect of the truth and blowing it up into something for for convenient reasons, right? Uh, Synthetic views liberalism is still progressive. All right. I'll talk about that because what does liberalism mean, right? What does liberalism mean? We have to talk about what liberal... As progressive. All right. Writing it down. Anyhow, we'll just keep going. We're just going to keep going, folks. All right. Um... Why did the Brezhnev split not rectify the Sino-Soviet split? What is it? Cornelius Cardu, the great Marxist composer in one of his songs, Kosygin and Brezhnev, they said in 1964, there is something wrong with Khrushchev, but trust us, we are your friends, natural allies of social and national liberation. Anyway, in 1964... Khrushchev was removed from power and Kosygin and Brezhnev took power in the Soviet Union, right? That's true. Um, and Kosygin and Brezhnev tried to restore relations with China. That's also true. However, uh, a huge amount of damage had been done to China's economy. You have to remember that in 1961, when the Soviet Union and China had their falling out, uh, buildings were left half built. Uh, the blueprints were burned. Huge amounts of aid that had been promised by the Soviet Union was never delivered. It was a really, really bad thing for China. China had been depending on Soviet aid and assistance, and all of that was pulled out. And that was very, very damaging. Um, on top of that, um, Soviet foreign policy remained about the same, right? Now, Khrushchev was removed from power. Kosygin and Brezhnev came in. But it wasn't really until about 1968 or 69 that Soviet foreign policy began to shift in a more radical direction. The policy of the Soviet leaders from the time of Khrushchev up until about 1968-69, uh, you know, you had detente, which was they agreed to call off the world revolution in exchange for, you know, the USA giving them peace. And that's why, you know, the Soviet support for Vietnam in the early years was limited. The Vietnamese people were fighting their war of national liberation. The Soviets helped them. They did help them, but it was limited. It really escalated in like 1969. Um, and that, you know, the, you know, we associate Brezhnev, Brezhnev, we associate him with, with, you know, you know, uh, revolution in Ethiopia with, with revolution in Angola, with, you know, vi winning the Vietnam war with, you know, with, with, you know, a lot of the, you know, support for Cuba, support for North Korea, the expansion of communist you know, armed insurgencies around the world. But that didn't happen immediately. Right. When Kosygin and Brezhnev first took power in 1964, when Khrushchev was removed from power and put into house arrest. Um, at first, Soviet policy didn't change. And China was still, at that point, trying to present itself as an ultra-revolutionary country. Chinese foreign policy didn't start to shift until about 1969. 1969, well, first of all, 1968, in Czechoslovakia, the USA overthrew the government, right? They overthrew the government, and they installed, you know, with U.S. support, you know, some U.S.-backed, you know, democratic socialists aligned with U.S. imperialism, toppled you know, toppled the pro-Soviet government and put Dubček into power. And at that point, the Soviet Union was forced to intervene. Um, and that was a moment, that was kind of a wake-up call for the Soviet Union because it was like, wow, the USA said they were going to leave us alone and then they intervened in Czechoslovakia and forced us to, you know, to send our military to Czechoslovakia. And then, you have to remember, uh, that in 1969, in Angola, Angola, uh, you know, there was a, a national liberation struggle going on in Angola. The people of Angola were fighting against Portuguese colonialism. And the leaders of the, of the Soviet Union were supporting the MPLA, uh, which was the, you know, the Communist Party. It's the ruling party in Angola now. Um, and China officially started supporting uh, UNITA, 
the, the, what is it, the Union for the Total Liberation of Angola, which were CIA people. And so that was, that was the first time China was blatantly aligning with U.S. imperialism. And that was also, that was also the first time, you know, 1968, you had China supporting the United States and denouncing the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia. So about 1968, 1969, China started shifting its policy in the name of being ultra-revolutionary, shifting its foreign policy uh, to supporting uh, the United States, whereas the Soviet Union started escalating its support for revolutionary forces around the world in Ethiopia and in Angola and in and many different countries around the world. So there was a shift, right? Soviet foreign policy shifted in 1969. Chinese foreign policy shifted in 1969. 1964, Khrushchev was removed, but Soviet po foreign policy hadn't really changed. So the reason that when Kosygin and Brezhnev reached out to Mao and said, all right, we got rid of Khrushchev. Can we be friends again? Mao said, screw you guys, because nothing changed. That's why. Um, you know, there you go. And yeah. Um, okay. Time management advice for socialists who work full time. I am a socialist who works full time. I've got a, a full time 40 hours a week job as a reporter. Um, I will say some people's job, you know, gives them less, you know, I mean, less free time than my job does. But, you know, I mean, managing your time is, is a challenge. And there's a lot of millennials and Zoomers who really struggle with, with managing their time. Um, you know, it can be very, very difficult. Um, you know, there's a, there's a book, I think it's called Problems of Everyday Life. And it's written by Lenin's wife, Krupskaya, right? And she writes about, she argues you should read in the morning when you first wake up rather than reading after work. If your job is very energy consuming, if you, you do a job where you like do physical labor or, or you, you know, it's better to not read after work, but to read before work when you first wake up. I think that's, um, I think that's pretty amazing. That's pretty good advice. Um, you know, um, but the main thing is to, you know, strike a balance and try to make plans, right? That's, a, that's an important thing. Make a schedule, make plans, and make the most of your days off. Start early on your days off. You know, um, one thing that I've heard, and I think this is kind of neat, one thing that I, I, I've heard is that, um, that you know, uh, I believe it was William Shatner, the guy who was on Star Trek, um, he said in a commencement address, he said, the best life advice he could ever give is get up early. Get up early, right? Because you don't accomplish anything sleeping. But, you know, if you wake up early, you, you, you will start accomplishing way more in a day than you were before. So there you go. Um, so especially, you know, w wake up early on a day off. Get an early start and try to get as much done on your, your day off as possible. Uh, where is this mandate stuff going? I don't know. Um, I, I am upset, folks. I am upset. I, I feel like there are forces in our government and the ruling class. There's a section of the ruling class, Amazon... Uh, Amazon, Walmart, Bill Gates that want to keep this going as long as possible. And um, it's pissing me off, right? We did this for a year. We did this for two years. I'm, I, now we, gotta, we all got to get a booster. Still haven't gotten my booster. I'm going to get it, but I haven't gotten it yet. And, you know, New York City, the cases are... I'm, I'm, I'm starting to ask questions here. You know, and I don't want to say anything before I'm ready to say anything, but... I'm getting really sick of this, and I think all of us are. It's wrecking our economy. It's driving down living standards. It's hurting the mental health of young people. Like, this, this is not okay. And I, I'm not saying I have the answer yet. I don't, I'm not ready to come out and say exactly, you know, give a clear answer, but I'm, I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of this. A lot of us are getting tired of this. And something's, something's not right about all of this. Okay. And I mean, COVID is real. It's absolutely real. I got it. The vaccine is not going to kill you. I'm vaccinated. Didn't kill me. The vaccine is real and COVID is real. Okay. So no Illuminati, but something's not right here. Something's not right here. And I don't like the light switch effect. I don't like the light switch effect. And that's what these idiots that are attacking me are, are, are doing. And that's that they, they don't get it. And, um, that's what these, you know, the, the, these people that are, you know, they do this thing where it's like, you either believe exactly what mainstream media says, or you're nuts, evil and racist and part of the white supremacist movement. And you're a neo-Nazi and you think that, you know, space aliens ate our brains. 
And it's like, I don't think space aliens in our brains. I'm not a white supremacist. I think vaccines are real. I got vaccinated. I'm a vaccinated person. I am a, you know, I am, I am definitely a believer in COVID because I got it. But I'm at the point where I'm saying mm, something's not right. Something's not right. I'm going to read Robert Kennedy's book. I haven't read it yet, so I can't tell you what I think of it yet because I haven't read it. Something's not right, okay? And you're, you, we should be allowed to say that, God damn it. And the, the fact that so many people who call themselves communists have gotten into this dualistic mindset where you're with us or against us. It was so funny. I made a post the other day about the Communist Party. I, I got to love this. I don't generally talk on here about, you know, um, right, um, I... Uh, Paragus, I can't go there tonight. I, I can't go there tonight, Paragus. I apologize. Or I, you know what? I'll write it down. Uh, demands on NATO. All right. But here, here's the thing. All right. Back to what we were talking about before. Uh, you know, you know, somebody, I, I made a post about, you know, the Communist Party and the role they played in the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. And somebody who's in the Communist Party tweeted about it. And you would think that they would tweet about how I was talking about their party and they didn't. What they tweeted about was, did you see he used the phrase Democrats and deep state? He's a fascist. These people don't care about communism. All they care about is defending the Democrats. I mean, I, I saw that and I'm like, wow, I just basically called out your party for propping up the Gorbachev wing of the Soviet Communist Party for feeding disinformation to the Soviet Union during the 1980s. And your response to it is, he said deep state, him use deep, him use word deep state, deep state Nazi word, him Nazi. That's all these people think about. They don't care about anything but defending the democratic establishment. I mean, argue with me about what that post, but he, I said deep state. My God, you know, it's not like that word, that phrase hasn't been used for years by Marxists and leftists. I criticized the Democrats. <gasps> yeah, I mean, it's just like, that's how these people are. These people attacking me don't care about communism. All they care about, all they care about is the Democrats. They are defenders of the establishment. Um, and there you go. Should you feel guilty about holiday consumerism? No, you should not feel guilty about holiday consumerism. Your family having a nice Christmas is not the reason for our environmental problems. The reason for your environmental prop for our environmental problems is the outdated system of fossil fuels. The reason for our environmental problems is the irrationality of capitalism and the inability of capitalism to rally around fusion energy, which is absolutely needed. Um, but no, 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 no. The idea that, that you, you, you Americans, you bought your kid uh, a stuffed animal for Christmas. Oh, that's destroying Mother Earth. You should be ashamed. I hate this. Average people are not the problem. The idea that average people buying too much stuff is the problem is called Malthusianism. That's not Marxism. So don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. All right. Um, is Putin a secret socialist? Well, um... Not that I, not that I know of. I mean, it, he is critical of capitalism. He's criticized capitalism in many of his statements, but he's also not a Marxist. Uh, he's he very much comes at things from a what is best for Russia kind of pragmatic perspective. But he knows Marxism very well. I mean, he was a KGB officer. He he knows about a lot about Marxism. He's very influenced by it. He says the fall of the Soviet Union was one of the greatest disasters in Russia's history. But he's not a Marxist. He's not a communist. But he's critical of Western capitalism. He, you know, the way he's fixed Russia's economy is asserting a, a higher level of state control. So, you know, Putin is Putin, right? He doesn't fit 20th century political categories. He's a leader of an anti-imperialist country. Uh, who's trying to do what's best for that country. Uh, and they've shed the Marxist ideology over there in Russia. They do not believe in Marxism. Um, but at the same time, they are very critical of Western capitalism. Um, you know, and they fit it in with kind of Russia's long-standing traditions and, you know, and history. And that, you know, Russia is Russia, right? Putin is Putin, right? So there you go. All right. Uh, the rise of China and the Belt and Road, they fear a domino effect. They fear competition. The United States and Wall Street, they want the world to be poor, a poor, impoverished, captive market so they can maintain their monopoly, right? It's about impoverishing the world so that they can stay rich, making the world poor and keeping the whole world poor so they can stay rich. And the Belt and Road Initiative is about bringing infrastructure to countries, raising people out of poverty so they can produce their own goods and become more prosperous. And that cuts into Wall Street's monopoly. That's what they don't like, right? If you had a store and somebody across the street opened a store of their own competing with you, you wouldn't like it, right? That's basically what's going on here. Um, yeah. 
There you go. Huey Long. Is Huey Long a fascist? No. Huey Long, uh, Huey Newton of the Black Panther Party is named after Huey Long. Huey Long was one of the most pro-black uh, politicians in the entire Jim Crow South. Um, Huey Long uh, had black ministers who were part of his Share the Wealth Club movement, his Share the Wealth movement. Uh, Huey Long rose to power in Louisiana by fighting the Ku Klux Klan. He was an ally of the Roman Catholics in Louisiana in their fight against the KKK and the Democratic Party. And all over the press in Louisiana, the people, the right wing, that didn't like Huey Long, they called him a communist and put pictures of him with hammers and sickles everywhere. They demonized Huey Long. Um, and they called him a communist. They called him a friend of the black people. They compared him to the, the Abraham Lincoln and the Northerners. He was constantly, the people attacking Huey Long were attacking him from the right. They were clearly attacking him from the right. Um, Huey Long was an ally of black people. Huey Long was an ally of Roman Catholics against the KKK. Um, Huey Long was a leftist. Now, it gets complicated because there was not, it was largely an agrarian state. There wasn't much of a labor movement in Louisiana. Huey Long was a champion of small farmers, not the industrial proletariat. Um, and because of that, um, there were, you know, that, that meant that the labor movement was not his thing, right? So he wasn't going around supporting strikes and labor stuff because he was in a rural state. So there, that's one thing. Second thing was the main thing um, that Huey Long did in order to economically stabilize the state of Louisiana was he taxed the Rockefellers, right? It was the Rockefellers that owned the oil of Louisiana. Louisiana has a lot of oil. And he taxed the Rockefellers and he fought the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers were Roosevelt's biggest supporters. So that put him in the anti-Roosevelt camp. The Communist Party was trying to defend Roosevelt from the far right, Huey Long was to the left of Roosevelt, and he was an enemy of the Rockefellers. So it was complicated, and there were times where Huey Long was sitting down with the National Association of Manufacturers, and and on a national level, his politics got really weird. But he, in Congress, he was an anti-imperialist. He was opposing U.S. military interventions. He was supporting the rights of black people. Uh, he was, I mean, he was not a fascist by any means. Huey Long was not a fascist. Huey Long was a populist. He was not a Marxist, but he was a populist. He was, a, I would say, a socialist. Um, but he was, he was a very important figure in American history that we can learn a lot from as a progressive. Um, you know, we can learn a lot from him. And calling him a fascist or a Nazi is is pretty ridiculous. All right, Brian Burletic. I love his stuff. Been watching his stuff. He's a great guy. Big fan. I hope to have a conversation with him soon. Next, October Revolution, which countries invaded the USSR? Britain invaded the USSR, seized the oil fields of Azerbaijan. Um, I believe France uh, invaded the USSR. The United States invaded USSR. Did you know that? The United States military was sent. There were US Marines and US Army reservists who were sent to the former Soviet Union to support the white army against the Bolsheviks. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe there were Germans who were sent. Uh, there was German forces that were sent to put down the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, yeah, there were many. It was 15 different countries invaded. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, why do the majority of U.S. leftists say they are atheists? Um, because of the communist tradition, right? Communists historically have been religious skeptics. Communists historically have been... Um, you know, have been atheists, right? Karl Marx was from a materialist perspective. Communism is associated with religion um, or is with, with opposition to religion. And also many religious groups push anti-communism in the United States. That said, there is a long tradition of religious leftists. Eugene Debs was a Christian. Um, in our book, Jesus is a Socialist, we have an essay by Eugene Debs talking about why Christian faith is so important to him. Um, and there is a long tradition of Christian socialists in the United States. But yes, especially since the Cold War, uh, anti-communism and, and religion walk hand in hand, and communism is associated with opposition to religion, etc. And uh, But the world is changing, and a lot has changed since that time. All right, Russia gas exports and U.S. attacks. The USA doesn't like a comp competitor. That's what it's about. Russia is a competitor. Every ounce of gas they sell is an ounce somebody didn't buy from Wall Street, from ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, and Chevron. The imperialists don't like competitors. They want to dominate the market. Monopoly capitalism. 
They don't want competitors. They want the world as their impoverished captive market. So all roads lead to Rome. Everyone does business with them. The global middleman in trade, the center of the global economy, that's the nature of imperialism. But the world is changing. We're moving toward a multipolar world where different countries are going to emerge from poverty, have their own industries, export their own energy, and Wall Street is trying to prevent that from happening. Next question. Is another Marxist-Leninist party going to come to power again? Maybe. I mean, look, the Communist Party of Nepal uh, is, is very influential in the government of Nepal, and it's a Marxist-Leninist party. It's a merger of the Maoist Party and the old Communist Party. And in Nepal, I mean, there, you know, in, in the 21st century, there was kind of an emergence of, you know, the, the communists, MLs in, in Nepal are very much in power in Nepal right now. Or, um, you know, uh, so that that's an example. Um, I think uh, uh, Peru Libre, the party of Pedro Castillo in Peru, uh, calls itself a Marxist-Leninist party, even though, you know, now they don't seem to be really putting that into practice, but their roots are with ML. So, no, ML isn't completely dead, but the idea that the old Soviet model is going to return, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, Marxism-Leninism looks very different, and socialism looks very different, and we should be open-minded. We should be 21st century socialists. All right. Is LaRouche an anti-Semite? No. In fact, I know a number of members of that group that are Jewish. Um, I, of, all, of the members of the LaRouche group I know, um, many of them are Jewish. Um, and they, they protest Wagner's operas. Did you know that? When Wagner's operas uh, have been performed at the Met in New York City, the LaRoucheites will protest against Wagner's operas because they consider, consider Wagner to be a Nazi and to be anti-Semitic. The LaRouche people, um, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not responsible for everything they've ever said. And I, I mean, I haven't studied their history in a huge amount of depth, but I've never found anything that they've said that, that says they hate Jews. Um, you know, many of their most prominent members are Jewish. So, you know, um, you know, I mean, you know, there you go. All right. Um, Kautsky, uh, was he, uh, the original synthetic left? Well, no, Kautsky was, Kautsky was the leader of the second international, and, you know, he fought against, quote unquote, revisionism and Edward Bernstein, but he wasn't a revolutionary. Um, and that, that under, you know, when Kautsky in Germany, his Marxist party very much became an institution that functioned under capitalism. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, he, he wasn't a revolutionary. Uh, when the moment came, um, he, he supported World War I, and then when the workers of Germany rose up and overthrew the Kaiser at the end of World War I, and there was a revolution that brought down the Kaiser, uh, they prevented you know, a, a, so, a socialist society from emerging in Germany in 1918. And then it was their party, uh, the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Kautsky and Schneidemann. They, they killed Rosa Luxemburg, and they killed Karl Liebknecht, and they prevented a socialist revolution. So yeah, Kautsky, they were not revolutionary. The synthetic left is a little bit different. They at least believed in some interpretation of Marxism. Um, you know, they had a watered down pro-imperialist version of Marxism. It was still Marxism. Synthetic leftism is not Marxism at all. They, Kautsky believed in historical progress, for example. Kautsky believed, uh, you know, believed wanted to raise workers' living standards, for example. The synthetic left now thinks workers have it too good because, uh, you know, because they're, they're privileged, you know, and, and they should all be poorer and because that's better for the environment and they want to go back to, you know, primitive conditions and they want to destroy civilization and they want to drive down living standards. And I know Kautsky wanted the wages of the workers in Germany to go up. He wanted labor unions to expand. He wanted, you know, things like free health care and education. The modern synthetic left doesn't want that stuff. They think if you want that, you're an evil class reductionist fascist. So Kautsky still believed in Marxism. It was just a watered down pro-imperialist interpretation of Marxism. Whereas the synthetic left of today does not believe in anything that is in. That's what the bread tube book is about. I make I make this distinction, but you know, between like revisionism or social democracy versus bread tube. Bread tube is far more sinister. The synthetic left is far more sinister, far more sinister than social democracy. They don't believe in historical progress. They don't want to raise people's living standards. They think the people are the enemy, right? They're anti-populist. Um, so there you go. All right. Um, um, the synthetic left views liberalism as progressive. Yeah, I mean, first of all, liberalism, we have to distinguish. In the United States, we talk about the Democrats as the liberals, like Rush Limbaugh, it's the liberals. You know, liberals as Democrats and left-wing people, conservatives as, you know, Republicans. Liberalism as an ideology is something that comes out of the 
of the Enlightenment. It's the belief of the individual coming before all else. It is the breakdown of collectivism and the belief uh, of the triumph of individualism. That's what liberalism literally means, okay? Um, and, you know, I Western liberalism, the ideology of, of liberalism, that the individual comes before all else, is, is in a crisis in the Western world. I've talked about liberalism and decay. I'm not talking about Democrats and decay. Talking about, you know, Republicans are market liberals. They believe in market liberalism, right? Democrats are more socially liberal. But liberalism, at the end of the day, this belief in radical individualism is tearing apart Western society. Um, and that's a problem, right? So when I condemn liberalism, I'm not condemning Democrats. I'm condemning an ideology. That said, yeah, the bread tubers seem to believe that the Democrats are on the right, right side, that it's our job to defend Democrats from the alt-right, that, that, Republicans and Trump supporters are the greatest evil and that anyone who doesn't meet anyone who in any way criticizes the Democrats is somehow de facto working for the Republicans. Uh, and that's a dangerous trap to fall into because it, it leads to defense of the establishment, which is what they're doing. All right. All right. Slave colonies joined the revolution. I mean, yes. I mean, you know, all over the world, many, many quote unquote slave colonies in the Caribbean had anti-colonial revolutions. That's absolutely true. Um, you know, uh, there's a great movie called Burn, uh, starring Marlon Brando. It's about an anti-colonial revolution. Uh, Marlon Brando plays a British intelligence officer who's sent to an island colonized by the Portuguese to incite a revolt so the British can take over. Uh, and it's actually a very good movie. Go watch Burn by Marlon Brando. Great movie. Great movie. All righty. Okay. Uh, demands on NATO made by Russia. Well, I mean, Russia, NATO needs to stop marching eastward, right? I mean, and NATO needs to stop pouring troops into Western Europe and into, you know, into places like Ukraine. And, you know, they're playing up this whole idea. Oh, my God, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. No, Ukraine, the government in Kiev, is planning an all-out onslaught against the people of the eastern regions. They've been killing them with drones. Uh, they've, they've blockaded them. And that's the issue here. The issue here is not, um, are not, the issue here is not, uh, that Russia is planning an invasion of Ukraine. The issue is that the Kiev government is planning to slaughter ethnic Russians in the eastern regions. And, they, and they're trying to distract from that. And they don't want Russia to be in a position to protect those folks. They're, they're trying to force Russia into a situation where it has to send in its military to protect the peoples of Donbass. Russia would prefer not to do that. But they're trying to create a situation where the people of Donbass are going to be slaughtered and Putin is going to have no choice. Thank you, Tusker. Uh, Putin is going to have no choice but to intervene to protect those folks. And then they're going to say, oh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, no. And Russia, I think, would like to do everything in its power to prevent this situation from happening. But that's what's happening is the Kiev government, you know, with the Av Azov Battalion, which is a blatant, openly neo-Nazi wing of the, of the government that's putting pressure on the Kiev government. Far rightists in Ukraine are demanding that, that the government in Kiev be more anti-Russian. They're killing their people with drones from Turkey. And so they're trying to set up a situation where, where Russia will be forced to send its military into Ukraine. Russia doesn't want to do that. It's very similar to the Afghan trap, what happened with Afghanistan, where they forced the Soviet Union to send its military to Afghanistan. They, over, you know, they overthrew a government on Russia's border. Uh, I mean, they forced the People's Democratic Party to take power, even though they didn't have you know, popular support in the countryside. And the Afghan trap, this is the Afghan trap all over again. Uh, they're trying to pull a Brzezinski and they're trying to create a situation in eastern Ukraine where Russia feels like it has to send its military in. That's what they're trying to do. That's what they're trying to do. And, um, you know, I hope Russia is able to effectively maneuver in a way where they don't have to do that. And the peoples of Donbass don't get slaughtered because that's um, that's what that's what the USA is trying to do. And the same with Taiwan. They're trying to create a situation where China will feel like it has to, you know, retake Taiwan. And, and then they can, you know, the USA, the USA wants to provoke a situation where there can be a conflict and Russia can be made to, into the aggressor or China can be made into the aggressor. That's what they're trying to do. Um, the USA is trying to do this, trying to maneuver a way that uh, the United States can look like it's stopping Russian aggression or stopping Chinese aggression. In reality, the United States has 800 military bases. China has one. Russia has eight. There, there's one. There's eight overseas Russian military bases. 
Thank you, Paragus. There is eight overseas military bases. There is a firm from, from Russia. There is one overseas military base from China, and there are over 800 military bases from the United States. Who's the aggressor in the world, my friends? The USA has its forces in the South China Sea. The USA has its forces in Ukraine and has been giving military aid to Ukraine and advising them. The USA has its forces in Poland. The USA has its forces all over the world. But yet we're supposed to think that Russia and China are the aggressors for operating mostly within their own borders. Give me a break. Give me a break. All right, folks. This is where we stop for tonight. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have continuously been launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. While the danger of a new world war still exists, the people of all countries must get prepared Revolution is the main trend in the world today. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. Good night.